So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Heather to kind of go through it. Then we're going to go through, um, we'll open it up for, well, we'll hit community concerns, then we'll open it up for questions and go for there. So over to Heather. I'm sorry, Colonel. Oh, hey, good evening. My name is uh, Colonel Brian Hulberg. I'm the district commander for the Norfolk district. Yeah, I'm happy to see everybody here this evening. Um, so, so why is the Corps of Engineers here? Well, the Corps of Engineers does a lot of things, but we're going to focus on civil works. And we have three civil works missions. Okay, so one is flood mitigation and protection. The second one is uh, navigation, so support to navigation and all the navigation channels that are here in uh, the Hampton Roads area. And the third is ecosystem restoration. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight, ecosystem restoration. And we don't just come up with these projects on our own, okay? So what we get is a letter of intent from a non-federal sponsor, in this case it was Virginia Beach, that asked the federal government to come and assist on rehabilitating the Lynn Haven River. Okay, so Lynn Haven River is um, it's an impaired river. It was listed in 1998 as being an impaired river. So why is it impaired? So I went back to the actual um, report that Congress authorized and signed, and, and it states in there, so the environmental decline of the Lynn Haven River has its roots in the agricultural methods used. Farming practices such as clearing and tilling of fields resulted in increased amounts of sediments, entering the water in columns while inadequate waste management practices accounted for high levels of bacteria such as fecal coliform. As farms gave way to neighborhoods, the bacteria levels remained high due to increased runoff from paved surfaces and um, septic tanks. Okay, so it's my understanding that, you know, the septic tank problem has been solved over the years and um, a lot of the bacteria problems, but it's left a concern. And so what's, what's the concern? Why is it impaired? Well, as Heather's going to explain here in a minute on the why and the how and what we're going to do about the subaquatic vegetation, the subaquatic uh, vegetation disappeared over time, okay? And so it's not there anymore. we got to rehabilitate it. Um, and the other problem is the dissolved oxygen. So that's what we're trying to improve. Those, those are the two goals, is to improve the SAV habitat and improve um, the dissolved oxygen in the Lynn Haven River. And so um, in that congressionally signed report, um, it gave us our boundaries of what we could do for this, this project. Okay, so we can restore approximately 38 acres of wetland, 94 acres of submerged aquatic vegetation, the reinduct introduction of the base scallops on 22 acres of the SAV and 31 acres of hard reef structures. Okay, and so I know we're working on the hard reef structures. Today we're going to talk about the subaquatic vegetation. And just for everyone's awareness, we have um, Mr. Chris Patrick on the phone uh, line. He is from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And then it looks like we have one other call in um, number also. So maybe that, that might, I think Chris. Yeah, Heather? Too. Yes. Heather, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, so it's Willie Ray from Vince. Awesome. Thank you, Willie. Great to okay. have you join us. I, I had trouble, yeah, I had trouble with the video link, but I was able to get it on the phone. Okay, perfect. So we have two folks from Vin, uh, Virginia Eastern Marine Science with us. And uh, so guys on the phone, we're just going to go through some slides and then we'll open it up for some pictures. Some questions, answers, look at all the pictures again if need be. Um, and hopefully everybody got a police mat. So if you didn't, um, we'll make sure you guys get one with some more information on it. So as Colonel Halberg mentioned, I'm Heather Lockwood. I'm the project manager for the Lynn Haven River Basin Ecosystem Restoration Project. The, um, the QR code right there is also on your police mat. That does take you directly to our project website, um, which has some monitor a monitoring report that the Virginia Institute of Marine Science did from our phase one SAV work um, in case you need more like more information. There we go. There we go. Okay. So as Colonel Halbert mentioned. 
mentioned, um, you know, I want to start with our why. So why are we here? Why are we having this project? Why um, is submerged aquatic vegetation so important? So you guys all want clean water. We understand that. That is one of the big benefits of having um, SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation. I'm just going to say SAV from now on, uh, within our ecosystem. So it's a, a critical habitat for all kinds of different species that we love, crabs, fish, um, even sea turtles, blue crabs, um, that we, we want to see in our bay, we want to improve. So we increase the habitat, we get the benefit of getting additional critters out into our Lynn Haven River system. I mentioned our water quality, also water clarity. The grasses help hold the sediment on the bottom, and that way, you know, if a boat goes by, the grasses can kind of hold the bottom, reducing the um, sediments from coming up into the water column, making it turbid. So uh, water clarity is also a side benefit of SAV. Um, as well as wave attenuation and shoreline protection uh, from erosion. We have uh, read all the protests that were submitted for the three joint permit applications that um, we submitted to the Virginia Free Resources Commission, and one of the ones was talking about property value. How is this going to impact my property value? When I bought my house, I didn't have submerged aquatic vegetation in front, which I will get to in a moment because you may have and not realize. But these, this uh, graph right here is um, courtesy of MIMS, and this is a correlation between the amount of seagrass so and the amount of SAV and, um, over the years, and then the turbidity, so the clarity of the water. And you can see as the grasses um, increase, the, uh, the turbidity the levels will decrease, so the cleaner the water. And that is, they actually um, have shared that there were studies done, the cleaner the water, the higher your property value. So think about where we are, in the Hampton Roads area, think about your property values on the Lynn Haven, think about other waterways and the cleanness and the clarity of levels of that water and those property values. It's, it's tightly co um, correlated. Clean water has a higher property value. So just something to think about. And also, as Colonel Hallberg mentioned, the, um, you know, we have, this is a habitat of severe decline. We used to have uh, over 600,000 acres of grasses. Now we're under 100,000. So we're starting to see you know, those impacts. But then also take a step further, why Broad Bay? That's also a question that we get. Why do, why do you guys keep targeting Broad Bay? And we're, again, we're not targeting Broad Bay for any reason except we wanna make your water better. We want you guys to still enjoy everything that you already enjoy out there. This will not impact navigation. This will not impact recreation. Again, the goal here is ecosystem restoration. So I mentioned, you may not have realized that you did have SAV in your backyard. The, in this uh, map right here, these orange polygons are the three leases where we did submit the applications for, three separate JPAs. And um, this little yellow figure is from our phase one. That's the lease where our phase one was done, which I'll touch on in a little. The blue outlines here is where the, gr the grasses were present in 1984. And then this pink right here is the last time that the grasses were present in 2015, if you can see. So since that time within these leases um within these specific leases you know we haven't had any sap but if you've been in your house since 1984 you may have seen grass or have had had grasses in the backyard you might not have even realized it so again we're not picking broad bay just out of a hat we're taking the historical footprints of where sab did used to inhabit we are learning about it we have a lot of questions at the last meeting about the success and the sustainability of the project I look back at our adaptive management and monitoring plan that's also part of the approved report where we say what happens if this fails, what are the triggers that we need to implement if it doesn't look like we're going to reach project success, and I will, I'll touch on that as well. But we do have um, a plan forward for that. As well as these two map, this map over here is from um, EPA, and that is just shows the, um, the degradation of for aquatic life. So. Broad Bay and the tributaries um, surrounding it are all listed as impaired for aquatic life. So the uh, hope is also, again, adding more habitat, we're gonna raise the aquatic life um, determination level. So again, this was kind of why are we implementing this phase? This is from our adaptive management and monitoring plan about what we do if we, um, we don't reach success. So our phase one project started in 2020 and that was through the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and it was uh, deemed a pilot phase because, again, no one had ever done this before. We had not tried to bring SAV back to Broad Bay before. So we knew the it was risky, it was a risky project. So we had to you know, consult the experts, which is the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. They have been 
restoring SAV since the late 1970s. So I said it on Thursday and I'll say it again, if anyone's gonna help us and gonna get SAV restored, it's gonna be Vince. They are the leading experts in the field and they've done it in other areas of the Bay. So we are leaning on them heavily for their technical expertise. Um, so phase one was a pilot. We planted about two acres uh, across a six acre lease and monitored that for a few years to see how it was successful. We did plant two different species, which I'll touch on too, it's uh, eelgrass and wedgie grass. They are both native species to the bay. Um, and tried to see how having two uh, species co-located, how they interacted. Um, one, so wedgie grass has a higher tolerance for uh, temperature. So, and eelgrass is a little bit more sensitive. So again, learning that you know, everyone talks about warming waters, the climate change, how are we gonna account for this? We knew all this going in again, Vince. Um, if you have very technical questions, I'm so happy they're on the phone because they can probably really um, answer them to a higher level than I can. So I mentioned also that on our website is the monitoring report from phase one. I pulled this little excerpt from our monitoring report. As again, a follow up, this slide was not part of last Thursday's briefing and I added this in just to kind of help um, further the questions that were answered. But um, so the, after the monitoring report, this was kind of what they said and I'll just, I'll read it for you guys. So overall, we provide evidence that opportunistic generalist species in habitat restoration is a proactive and effective approach as these species can increase foundation species diversity, which for our study increased restoration area and more generally increases the ability for restored beds to promote facilitation cascades, stability, and grass persistence through changing environments. So throughout that, that report, they addressed that we are in a changing environment, we have to adaptively manage, that's part of ecosystem restoration, and why we have a 10-year adaptive management and monitoring phase, because we are monitoring, we're looking for triggers, we're gonna adapt, we're gonna apply lessons learned as we move throughout the project. So I know you guys already know that it's an Army Corps of Engineer project. Our non-federal sponsor is the city of Virginia Beach. Um, so they are responsible financially for 35% of the project. This project was fully funded at 39 million back in 2018. Of that, another question that came out um, last week was how much is that budgeted for SAV? So of the total project, so we're, we're aiming to restore 94 acres of SAV, about 3 million of that was budgeted for SAV. I mentioned on Thursday, this particular phase, we have about $300,000 um, for this phase. That's what is, what is budgeted of that. So just to give you an idea, if you see this 39 million, that's not all going to SAV, that's for the whole project across um, the hard reef goals, the wetland goals, and the SAV goals. And just like phase one, uh, Virginia Eastern Marine Science is our contractor, or are, they are our contractor, so they perform phase one, they monitored in 2021, 2022, made their monitoring report. This year provided um, additional data gathering and um, support to, to say, yes, we can do this. Let's, let's up the ante a little bit, go from two acres, let's try to do 25 acres. And that's what our JPAs are submitted for, for a total of 25 acres for this phase. And the two species we are gonna be using again, wood and grass and eelgrass. Um, locations and the time of year for planting will be dependent on when we can um, hopefully get our permits and move forward. Um, I won't touch too much on that, but again, the important thing with this is that they are native species. That was also a thing in the protests was talking about non-native um, species, which is not something we are doing here. And where, so where within these leases are we going to be proposing um, to put the grasses? They are very uh, sensitive to where they are placed. We can't just place them anywhere throughout the whole lease. That we um, learned from phase one, as well as just of a history of, of studying these grasses, that we can only plant them in uh, water at one and a half meters or shallower. So one and a half meters is about 59 inches. So just like last week, I had boots on. If I take my boots off, that's as tall as I am, pretty much. So we are planting um, the grasses in the shallow water. It's a, a plant, so it needs sunlight and clear water, so we can't plant in, in deep water. Um, so we have, Vince has identified through uh, years of water quality monitoring, so in tandem with our SAV work, um, Dr. Willie Ray, who's also on the phone, he has been leading the charge for water quality. So um, measuring things like temperature, dissolved oxygen, um, all the things that we need to, to learn about this system 
to make smart strategic decisions on where we plant. And then Chris and his team have identified these sites uh, as the preliminary first about 10 acres, which we will be uh, hoping to plant this, this next upcoming year. And one of the things that we talk about with um, in the area is the, the height of the grasses. So folks have talked about concerns with navigation, with their boats, with um, the grasses coming up into their uh, propellers and such. And just want to give you an idea of what we're looking at lengthwise. So the, the shorter the shorter length here, three to four inches, is our widgeon grass. That's the one that has a little bit of a higher tolerance um, for the warmer waters in the, um, in the in the system. And then our eelgrass is longer. The max height of that is 15 inches. So anywhere from 12 to 15 inches is where we will be seeing um, these grasses grow uh, within the, the river. So timeline, folks always want to know to when. When can we plant? So depending on the permit approval process, we would like to start planting as soon as possible. MIMS has collected the seeds um, through donor beds. So they went out and collected these the grass seeds. They're currently holding them, watching them carefully, making sure they don't germinate. Um, and then we would like to plant, again, both species in January, depending on the process. Um, and then again, we would plant in October. October is that we've learned also from phase one, October is a prime time as well um, for the grasses to be sur for survival. Um, the next phase of restoration, you know, I said we're 25 acres plus our two acres from phase one. That leaves 67 additional acres that we would like to, to uh, plant within the Linhaven River uh, to make our 94 acre goal. Now again, we are learning while we're going and we are going to continue adaptively managing. So after this phase of 20, our 25 acres, again, we'll huddle up with VIMS, we'll listen to um, their technical expertise, their recommendations, and move forward with there. So, so I can't say what our next phase would be just yet because again, we're kind of learning as we, as we go and again, making our smart strategic decisions. So how will the grass seeds be planted? So VIMS will be taking um, just a small skiff out and they're hand broadcasting the seeds. So they will be planting the seeds by hand. It replicates the natural, what happens out in the, um, in the waters naturally. Folks have asked, okay, well then are the seeds gonna float away and are they gonna go somewhere else? And um, we had Lyle uh, Barnell here last week from VIMS and Chris can uh, confirm this, but uh, he, he confirmed that the seeds are heavy enough they will sink to the bottom and then they will um, stay there. They don't move that much. As well as people have talked about the velocity. Again, in our report, I looked back at our report as well after last week's discussions and the areas that we've chosen, you know, we wouldn't be putting, we should not be placing and planting grass in areas with high velocity water anyway, not only for the survival of the grass, but then the planting as well. So that is also a consideration that has been adequately thought of and uh, Chris's team is aware of. I mentioned ecosystem restoration um, for our projects. We don't just construct them, walk away, turn them over to sponsors, say good luck. We don't do that for our ecosystem. We uh, have a period of adaptive management and monitoring. So as soon as the project is complete and the grass seeds are planted, uh, Chris's team and, and their contract currently expires in 2025, and then it would move into the monitoring phase. And that, um, we are currently working on a contract for that. We still don't know who that um, the contractor for that will be, but then we move into, like I said, monitoring. So then we're looking at the success. We're doing just like we did for phase one, um, figuring out, okay, are there any triggers that should trigger adaptive management? Do we need to continue planting the seeds? Is there something we could have done better? Um, you know, what? how can we continue this effort? Can we continue this effort? We're answering all these questions to ourselves, asking, um, I ask very, Chris will tell you, I asked him very frank questions about this um, because they are the ones um, that are gonna, you know, tell us if it's gonna be successful or not. And they, after phase one, said, yes, let's go for it. We had success after phase one. We know that the two species um, can co-locate and can survive well. So let's keep moving and see if we can get this done. Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't think our native oyster was gonna be able to ever live in the bay again. We talked about introducing a non-native Asian oyster. Now look at us, now we have a robust oyster population. We are providing food for the Commonwealth. We're shipping oysters out. We have, we're having cleaner water. So again, why, why do we have to um, say we can't be successful without trying? 
And I, I mentioned this a little bit, I already touched on how tall the grass will be. This is a picture from our phase one site. You can see it's shallow water. You can see the little patches of grass. This is how we anticipate it growing. It's not gonna be a thick, dense meadow of grass. Um, you know, right off the bat, it's not, it, that's not what it's gonna look like. This is how we are planting it. And in this kind of system, this is what we're looking for. This would be our success metric. And we took our underwater remote operated vehicle or ROV out in May to one of the sites to, to see if we could see anything. Now given May, water quality, our water clarity is not as clear as like, you know, this time of year in January, but you can see the grass as we're moving along the bottom. That is the um, eelgrass that we're looking at. So again, it's not this thick, dense bed of grass um, that we are, we're, that it's gonna look like. It's gonna be something like this so you can see little grass coming up. Um, as mentioned, no impacts to navigation or creation. You can still swim, you can still boat in the area, you can still anchor. We're not limiting anything. There will not be any navigational markers or anything precluding you from our planting sites. Um, our hope here is just to hopefully add some nice grass to the bottom and um, provide more habitat for our critters that we love. So. This is also a key goal in the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement 2014. It's one of our the vital habitats that were identified with a big hefty goal um, identified. So our goal is 94 acres in the Lynn Haven, but Baywide, they have identified they want to restore 130,000 acres by 2025. So our 94 acres will hopefully help obviously get to that goal, but it's really just a drop in the bucket as to what um, has been identified as really will help, um, you know, kickstart our systems and bring our, our Chesapeake Bay back to the level of health that we want to see it. Um, obviously our goals again too is, you know, improve the aquatic life designation if we can, adding the habitat, you know, the fish, the crabs will come, all the things that um, you guys, if you're recreational fishermen, love to see, your kids love to see, um, and it just goes up the trophic levels there. Our phase one reef site, we saw, I went out there a few months ago and saw dolphins. So again, we're just, we're starting to see these critters come back and um, you gotta start from the habitat and we'll build up from there. And that is my final uh, slide. So I will, um, I don't know if we wanna take some questions or I don't know if you know anybody on the phone has anything they wanna say or add, but I am. Um, let's yeah. go back to the community, community concerns that we'll take questions. So we've hit uh, where exactly planned for, so the areas have already been discussed. What does it look like, the little patches? Heather did a great job showing that. And then impacts on recreational boating, jet skiing. Um, I jet ski a lot, and we have had and been in areas where you've sucked in uh, the eel grass, the grasses, and had to uh, get towed out, pull it out, and uh, clear it up. So it's from that standpoint, and you know, it is a meter and a half there. Well, that's prime jet skiing area too, is a meter and a half. Um, probability of success. Uh, last time we had Lyle in the audience, um, and he talked about the probability of success. Um, we've got the VIMS folks on. You guys want to chime in on that? Um, similar to what Lyle had discussed uh, last week. Um, sure. Hi, this is Chris Benetrick with the uh, SAV Restoration Monitoring Program. Um, you know, it depends on your definition of success, what the probabilities look, look like. Um, but what we've seen in the last four years of monitoring and restoration work is um, some positive signs. We've seen natural wind and grass, open beds, uh, popping up and expanding from period of time in the bay after year, several years of not seeing any. Um, we've got transplanted donor beds that we, we put in that have weathered the last three years since they planted. We've had mixed success with the uh, with the eelgrass. We planted it from seed. Um, we're not sure how sustainable that's going to be in the long term, uh, particularly with climate change. But um, we saw enough uh, positive results that we felt 
we can move forward and uh, try expanding and try some different areas um, and see what kind of success we're going to have. I can't put a number on the probability of success though, because um, that's something I can't um, can't do at this point. Um, but we're, we're, we'll think it's worth trying. Okay, Chris, thank you. It's a little different than what Lyle said, but that was last week and this is this week, so it is what it is. Um, so well, what's higher than what Lyle said, sorry. Um, Lyle said the probability of success was very, very small um, because of the velocity of the water going through the area and the temperature increases, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly what he said, but um, he kind of went down that path. Um, but it is what it is. Lyle's not on this time, it's Chris, so we can, so, uh, people have different opinions. Yeah. This is Willie, if you want me to add a few things. Sure, Willie. Okay, uh, so when you were talking about, so there's a reason why uh, Broad Bay's a, 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 a little different than the rest of the area. So when you get into this, so we're talking the broader Lip Haven River system, which is the, the essentially the the river proper right near the bridge there, and then you have the two kind of sub tributaries. Those have what we call our shorter residence times, and so we'll have a little bit of cooler water. When we start getting into Broad Bay, Lincorn Bay, what happens is uh, we have limited circulation patterns, and so the residence time jumps up quite a bit. It can be, you know, 50, 60 days uh, before the water would get from Linkhorn out. Uh, the reason for that is you really don't have a big riverine system pushing that water out. It's, it's primarily tidal action. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons, you know, when you're when you're looking at this, the residence time of water, the heating of that water. Uh, I do want, I didn't, I don't think Chris saw this number, but when we look at SAB and what we're typically doing is we're applying heat numbers to the eelgrass and the eelgrass is more sensitive to the heat. Uh, and Chris might be able to confirm this, but I believe, you know, we might be looking at five, six degrees centigrade difference uh, between, let, let's say, an eelgrass and a wishing grass. But when we look at cumulative heat, so whenever, so in, in the Chesapeake Bay area, which the Lynn Haven would apply, uh, I don't have the numbers in Fahrenheit, so I apologize to the audience if it, uh, the centigrade gets them off a little bit. Uh, but what we're looking at is we're trying to stay under 28 degrees centigrade. I think that's roughly around, uh, oh, geez, 80, some, 80 some degrees. Uh, and so, what happens is that varies uh, over the year. Let's, I'll give you some examples. Uh, when we try to compare uh, Broad Bay to let's say some of our areas that we have well-established bays, uh, and we kind of do a comparison, we would call those like reference sites. We can kind of look at what is the heat stress in terms of cumulative days over the summer. Uh, and so what we've used on the report that I'll be sending in is Goodwin Island, which is at the mouth of the York, uh, that's one of our research reserve sites. Uh, but to give you an idea, we generally are looking something like about 10 days, maybe, well, more on the order of let's five to six days less in terms of the heat stress. Uh, the number we're trying to keep it under is about 45 days. Uh, to give you an example for Broad Bay, when we started, we had uh, some heat stress events in 2020 and 2021 that we would deem as uh, a little bit, a little bit higher than we would a cooler restoration site. 2022 met the criteria, and I think that's when Chris saw some good results coming in. 2023, we had a, a bit of heat stress again in 2023, and the other thing is the timing of the heat stress when these longer periods of warm water. So, what we're seeing is we might have this warm water come in, set up. It's highly dependent on the air temperature uh, in broad day. And so what happens is the heat stress could set up. If it happens earlier in the year, that can have a little bit more impact than later in the year. The heat stress starts like late June, July 1st, and can go to about September, uh, right at the beginning of September. So it is a stressful site for it. Uh, and, you know, if you're looking at it, I think that was a wise decision to go with the two species approach. 
uh, because as we've noted, rupia has a, a much better heat tolerance. So I'll just back off from that. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, 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 that's helpful. Um, I should say that, um, you know, we are talking about two species and the problem with really long-term success in nuclear acts, uh, provided that we're able to uh, uh, continue to have available habitat and clear, clear water or improving water, it's going to be a lot better than the new grass simply because of those heat stress issues. Part of the reason why it's difficult to put an exact probability um, on these projects is that um, we're talking about the uh, intersection of multiple stressors, and these aren't necessarily all fixed thresholds. Uh, for example, we do have some new grass meadows in the coastal regions and some back bays, which will regularly be above 30 degrees C and get up to 35 C. And they do quite well, um, but they also have the seemingly clear water that's coming in on the tidal cycle right by the ocean. Um, so the combination of low water quality with rising temperatures um, uh, really is um, uh, exacerbates the heat stress issue. So you know these numbers that we use as thresholds are more like general uh, relationships that have been derived, um, but there are exceptions to uh, to the rules. So that makes sense. And, and just to follow up what Chris was saying, we generally see the water clarity stress come in, you know, it could be a couple months before heat stress uh, would begin. Yeah. Got it. And then with the velocity, primarily in broad day, and then I guess the time where it's the warmest, so June, July, August, September um, is also when we have the highest velocity, and the velocity not just from the tidal standpoint, but from the boats going back and forth. Um, on a weekend, we literally get thousands of boats through Broad Bay going in and out, and some recreating in Broad Bay itself. Um, but let's move on to uh, sustainment of the project. So is this a once and done project, or is this something that's added every single year? And I'm gonna turn it back to Heather for this one because I don't remember the answer to this from last time. So right now, this we are planning the 10 acres, uh, hopefully for January, and then VIMS will continue to monitor throughout the summer like they would, they normally do, and then hopefully in October, we'll identify either another five to 10 acres or so, or maybe even we can do the 15, up to 25, so that's what we're asking, that's what the permits are for, is up to 25 acres. Um, and then after that, we're gonna kind of pause again, just like we did from phase one, evaluate the success of the time for the grasses to grow, figure out, you know, what is our next steps? Again, making smart, I said it a few times, but smart and strategic decisions um, based on those results. Question on the probability of success. Uh, let's say uh, you got it in and it, it took off a little bit and then faded away, it's, and this is for bins. Is there a concern about the reversal of water quality if it fails? What if it fails? What what's left behind? Is that a problem, or is it just is you know is it sediment? What what does it turn into? Did you guys hear that? You want me to repeat the question? Yeah, I didn't quite hear that. Okay, so um, uh, Mr. Miley was asking about let's say we we plant, we have success uh, for a few years, and then the SAB guys back off. Um, what are the potential repercussions to water quality would we would we see a, I guess a decline in water quality um, if we met the success and then it dropped off uh, so oh, I guess what what water quality parameter the like water clarity the things that we're trying to fix yeah I would say so because you mentioned like sediment sediment so turbidity yeah clarity yeah, Chris, you could follow up, but I would say, you know, it's going to be dependent on the acreage of SAV out there, but it's very effective uh, at creating a sediment trap. So, you know, you would be potentially seeing a, a decrease in water clarity. We would expect it to get a little bit cloudier. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Um, so in terms of like the trajectory, if you were able to establish, you know, acres of SAV, we would expect to see improvements in water clarity over the meadow 
Um, and then if that meadow disappeared, we would expect things to return to as they were before the meadow was there. But I think that the spirit of the question was, would the system be worse yeah. after the SAV disappeared than it was before we planted the SAV, um, if, I, if I'm interpreting that correctly. Um, and in terms of the long-term impact, I, I wouldn't think so. Um, the material of the grass itself, if it died, um, it would be remineralized, decomposed um, fairly rapidly. We're not talking about a huge amount of biomass. And um, the material that was trapped that maybe gets remobilized and moved um, is stuff that would have been in the system anyways. And we could just be going back to what we have like currently right now, I think, too. So. What's the advantage of grass versus oysters? So I, they, um, the question was, what's the advantage of grass versus oysters? And I'll take the oyster side and then I'll let them take the, the grass side, the technical. So just they're two different you know, habitats. So they provide habitat for um, some similar species and some totally different. So we have our oysters, they're active filter feeders. So they are also improving the water, water quality. They are providing um, interstitial spaces for all of our critters, some, again, some that are kind of overlapping with SAV. Um, but as far as, um, I mean, I guess that, that that's well, what I would say. The reason for why it least. sounds like oysters have been very successful, right? We, Correct. Gosh, what we've seen in the last 20 years. So why not just keep going with oysters knowing it's a success rate? What, we're trying to get clearer water, isn't that, isn't that a good idea? So, yes. Um, I would just say that they probably, you know, I'll, I'll turn it over for that for the SAD part, but as far as this project, um, so no one on the room, like, you know, like as we were here a year ago with the oyster project, um, we have met the, met the goals for the oyster component of the 31 acres after this next phase is constructed. Um, but I mean, I would love to, you know, I love oysters and the more oysters, yes, the more cleaner the water, but I think we now have to be very strategic and, um, considerate of the user conflicts and things like that in Broad Bay. So from our standpoint, we're gonna not do any more oysters. So um, Chris, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you for just the, the benefits of maybe SAD in comparison to oysters. Sure. Um, so I mean, SAD provides many benefits uh, in addition to uh, enhancing water clarity. Um, it can be a source of blue carbon, so carbon sequestration. It provides habitat for a number of organisms uh, that you wouldn't necessarily be uh, preferentially finding in oyster reefs. So there's some differences in the types of species that are using the SAV meadows. Um, and uh, we also will find that waterfowl love um, SAV meadows for, for forage. Um, and um, there's also some benefits in terms of shoreline protection, uh, reducing wave energy. Um, so it, it, it's a different habitat. And if you think about the, the Broad Bay Red Haven system as what we sometimes will call a, a meta uh, ecosystem or seascape, um, we really want a diversity of habitats, not just one monoculture habitat, um, to enhance the overall diversity of the system, which will allow fish to move between habitats getting different kinds of resources. I'll, I'll chime in a little bit with what's kind of gotten us where we are today with cleaning the Lynn Haven. And truly it was when Lynn Haven River now um, got the uh, sewage systems, uh, everybody on city sewer and off the private sewage systems we had a lot of them overflowing into Broad Bay. Well, the last one was just down the road here in 2010 or 11 is when they got that pulled off. And I think I was on council and uh, did three public hearings on that. And at the last one, they said, so what you're saying is the train's already left the station. I said, the train's left the station down the track. We're already starting on the engineering. We finished the engineering. And by uh, within a year, we'll have that entire uh, neighborhood off of private sewer, which every time the sewage failed, we had excessive rains, would go directly into Broad Bay. Um, those uh, did more for, and the, the whole thing was, you know, don't dump the poop in the bay or clean the poop. Uh, that did more for the river and getting oysters regrowing in Broad Bay than anything we've done. Then last week when we were here, we talked about um, when the 
former colonel, I guess he was two or three colonels before you, Dave Hansen, uh, was the uh, head of public works and in that whole role. He did a great brief and then um, a, an educational seminar with me afterwards, <coughs> explaining that you know the pipes that we have dumping directly in and we have, I believe it's, I, I think the number I used was over 3,000. I don't know the exact number, but I'm still pretty sure it's over 3,000. Do you know the exact number? Or about, but about 3,000, right? Over 3,000. So when Dave Hansen was here, he said, hey, stopping the runoff going into um, the channels and everything, um, we're working on that. We have a program, we're putting money into that. We've got kind of the timeline. He goes, but the thing we need to do, which would help clean it up better than anything we've ever done and cover the sins of the past is dredging from the pipe out um, down to sand and getting all that crud that's been put in there over the last 50 years plus, um, that would do more for cleaning it than about anything we could do. Um, we had a conversation on that and this pot of money doesn't come under the environmental dredging portion and I don't understand how the Army Corps works. I understand how SOCOM money works with MFP 11 and SOCOM money. I understand how Navy money works. I don't know Army uh, money and how they go from one pool to another, one pot to another. So, um, But those are the things that I think have helped, would, would help the most in the future and have helped the most in the past, is when we stopped with the um, overflows that went into Broad Bay. Um, but I'd like to open it up for other questions as well, and hopefully we answered your question in an exhaustive way. So, Mr. Corte and then Mr. Well, actually, I have to All right. He can vote for me, you can't. That's right. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. John. John and then John. Yeah, come on up. Sure. Or have the mic. So uh, we have, have a mic. So so Heather in the uh, original pilot project, you had reforms. And you had pilots. You said no pilots. Are there gonna be any reforms? Yeah. No reforms. And in the uh, original report, a couple colonels before you. One of the contingencies was putting in no wake zones wherever you had SAD. Is there any chance of that? Okay. See? No new wake zones. Okay. No wake zones. Okay, that's important. Um, another thing that I, I've read about this, is this going to be like uh, planting your yard where you have to seed every year? So you're going to be like in a maintenance type mode until you get to like a pivot point where you actually have it take off? Or is that, do you know, and does that, per, does this permit cover multiple years or would you have to go back and do something for that? So, um, Chris, he more. was asking oh, about, is this mic, is gonna be like an annual, an annual seating thing? And, um, it, you know, we're gonna have to keep going back. And that is, you know, one of the things that we have to consider. Uh, I know for our phase one site, we've talked about maybe going back and um, adding some additional seed, but I don't know if you wanted to add anything else on top of that. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's not the goal. Um, if we would, if we need to see it annually to maintain it, um, then I would consider this project to be a failure. Um, if um, what we're hoping we can do is establish some meadows that will persist for multiple years and start seeding on their own. Um, within the course of this, we might try planting some different species within the same uh, areas, like planting more widgeon grass in the phase one site than we did initially. We're planting some deeper yule grass, trying some different things like that. But um, we don't have any intention of trying to do like some kind of annual planting. Uh, Chris, this is Willie. It may be useful to talk about uh, the seed the seedbed and then maybe, you know, the, the, the regrowth from the roots. Uh, you know, you've got two mechanisms it might be interesting for the audience. Try and help sustain that bed. Uh, sure, yeah. So, um, I mean, we have, uh, well, there's two different species that we're talking about. So the first one, uh, widgeon grass, which is the one which is uh, shorter, it needs more light. So I think it's a, it's a more light linear species, but it's also more temperature tolerant. Um, that species is really prolific with seeding when it gets going, and it can actually reproduce um, within a few months of germination. So we have plants that will, will come up 
uh, that first spring and start skating immediately he's on his neck. Uh, that's really different. Oh, and then another thing is that the, uh, the seat bay for winter grass, it lasts for up to 10 years. Uh, so you can have seeds which will sit in the sediment and then a few years after um, you get good conditions, all of a sudden they'll pop up. That's really different from yield grass. Um, yield grass in our region will not set seed its first year. It needs to be around for two years. And then that second year, it'll produce seed. And that seed will not survive in sediment uh, as a seed bed. Um, so, uh, so that's one kind of difference between these plants and the seed consideration. The other thing that I think uh, 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 Dr. Ray was referring to is our uh, is rhizome expansion. So we have uh, below ground rhizome uh, root complexes associated with species. And so you'll get uh, clonal vegetative expansion uh, happening through the rhizomes expanding, in the case of eelgrass, up to 30 centimeters um, in all directions per year. So uh, these small patches can start to spread out and sort of interact with one another. Um, and then um, we can also have um, uh, uh, vegetative break off and rerouting, uh, especially with wishing grass. So if you get a chunk that gets broken loose and manages to settle someplace else, you can actually reroute and start a new patch. Um, so there's a couple of different mechanisms of uh, reproduction of these plants. Okay, thank you. Uh, is this on? Is it on? Okay, uh, my next question is more of a bureaucratic question. So, um, City of Virginia Beach has three leases in Broadway that this is going on. Um, DMRC does have like a harvesting requirement. Is that exempt? And um, will these, since this is public money going into uh, creating this uh, environmental section here, will this be productive? So I'm Randy Owen, I'm the Chief Habitat Manager, so I want to make sure I understand the question. If the leases that are controlled by the city are permitted to be seeded, mm -hmm. then, you know, no one else can harvest shellfish in that lease because it's controlled by the city. Um, ironically, if the seeds, if the SCB spreads to the adjacent leases of the commercial, the current shellfish laws do not allow aquaculture to expand into the SCB beds. So it, it could uh, result in a <laughs> uh, user conflict between the existing aquaculture industry and, you know, and if the SCB spreads. I, I, but I think your question was, I'm sorry, what's that? So I, I don't My think I understand your question. Is, is that um, at least the commercial guys, they have to show that they're harvesting right. leaves. Right. Now in the city or, or uh, a public entity yeah. has a lease and yeah, it comes yeah. after 10 years, do they have Absolutely. to? Absolutely. They have to, they have to show that they've done the at the 10 year proof of use to, to retain the lease. If they don't, the lease reverts back to a vacant ground. Is that true for like a city of Virginia Beach or? In, in any lease, in any lease. If, if they don't show production after 10 years, the law requires the lease to be you know, vacated. <coughs> and then it becomes available for release and unless the commission sets it aside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there has to be shellfish propagation for the lease SAB is not going to allow it to be released in 10 years. It has, it has to be a minimum level of shellfish propagation. I think that was your question. Right. And we have, we are bound by our congressionally authorized project to spend that money to implement these goals and objectives. Um, so any deviation from that would, you know, we would have to go back up to Congress for, to do anything different than what the approved plan was. Um, so that's just a little side on how we're, how we're funded. So does DMRC need to redefine policies for these leases if they have SAD? Um, that's it not sounds, a question. I mean, <laughs> oh, it okay. sounds to me like that needs to be addressed. So currently we have SAB guidelines and, we, and right now you are not uh, under that program. It, it, the aquaculture cannot expand beyond its existing footprint into SAB. If SAB goes into the area, like we see this a lot in clam beds on the Eastern Shore. There's tons and tons and tons of product overboard under these nets that are, you know, harvested. And the 
it's at best. It has come into the areas where the clams do, obviously, filter feed, and it needs to water quality. That city has moved in. But there, they cannot expand the footprint of the operation in, into areas that have SAV now. And so whether or not we need to you know, change the policy, I guess it's a, it's a function of the public, public interest. And, but the, the... The part that I was asking was the lease renewal Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Well, you know, this has no intention of having uh, oysters in it, right? I don't. I won't leave that to the core, but it, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not part of our project. It's not part of the project, right? right. You can uh, to maintain the lease. You, you don't need the lease to have a permit to grow SAV, but they have a lease and they're planting within their leases. To maintain the lease is is is, is whatever the resource is that the. Um, uh, you have to you have to have your minimum you know uh, annual shelling of the area to prop show that you should the property getting sheltered. It doesn't require harvest. This requires some measure of, of effort to show that you're propagating shellfish, whether it's for harvest reasons or for ecological reasons. So the tenure proof of use is is in place now. And, and, yeah. and I'm sorry, just from my perspective. In the, you know, we talk about a multi-dimensional approach to cleaning the water, and respectfully, I would say that just doesn't that policy doesn't make a lot of sense if you say this lease is for SAP. Well, all of a sudden now we have to shoe more oysters into it. it. It just doesn't make sense to me. I, I would suggest that maybe we need to take a look at that because uh, it's not part of the project. I, I mean. Correct. We're not putting. We, as part of this project, we're not putting any oysters. I'm, I may be wrong, but it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I just have uh, one comment and one question for Senator Deesta. I did shave. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I noticed that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Senator, the Colonel said that there needed to be a non-federal sponsor for these for these efforts, and in this case, it's the City of Virginia Beach. Did the, this may be for Heather too. Um, did the did the core go to Virginia Beach and say, "Hey, we need a sponsor"? Did Virginia Beach come to the core and say, "Hey, we'd like to do this"? Because obviously, there's some lack of citizen input on that. Mm, I would. You want to? No, I don't. Because it's not in my Right. Yeah. yeah. All these efforts started. Um, well, they were. <clears throat> the report got approved in 2013. So. I mean, usually, I, I was not around, so I can't honestly speak to that, but usually it's still. I've been here 37 years. I was assigned to Virginia Beach. Um, it is my understanding the city approached the federal government for it, for this, this restoration project. Well, it started a long time ago, like the 90s, right? Yeah. No, this is the approved Millennium River Basin. So I, I left Virginia Beach in 2004 when I was a citizen here for a while. Um, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, in the late 90s is when this kicked off and Lynn Hamer River now became who they are because of this effort, is what I understand. And then um, I went to meetings at the core at Fort Norfolk in the late 90s, early 2000s, met at PDC, um, and then I passed the baton several times after that to now Tiffany. But I believe it got started in the late 90s. It takes a long time for a federal problem. <laughs> long time. Yeah. Uh, Senator, so the other the other thing that, that was mentioned is, you know, why don't we put oysters there instead of you know, grass? We just have to understand we're talking about a meter and a half of water here. That's highly recreational water. And the last thing you want under your feet in highly recreational water is oyster bed because it will cut you to shreds. So, you know, that that's just my two cents. So thank you very much. Additional questions? Yeah, sure. So if I recall correctly, the eelgrass, um, that spreads asexually through rhizomes at with a radius of either 17 or 27 meters per annually. Um, Meters, if, if I recall correctly. So what, uh, what Chris shared was, was 30 centimeters. Centimeters, yeah, not centimeters. meters. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> well, big difference, yeah. So let's, let's just say that if this project does take off and uh, 10 years down the line, this thing really starts spreading, and if it doesn't end up propagating all over the place, what are some organisms that are to keep this population in check and not to keep spreading? What keeps the population level in balance? Like the kudzu problem. Like, yeah, yeah. Not, not, not that country well, we put on the highway sides to help stabilize the bank and yeah. it took yeah. over the world. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> and not a major country. Hey, Chris, so Chris, the question, I'm going to let you um, answer this, but the question is, how do are becoming so widespread, at least in the, the saltwater parts of the Lower Bay, and they're becoming a nuisance. Um, we're concerned about the clients of grasses throughout the Lower Bay. Uh, we would love to have them uh, become a nuisance uh, in, in some areas. As you may have heard about species like hydrilla, recreational water milfoil, or water chestnut in the freshwater parts of uh, some, some of our Virginia and Maryland rivers, where they, they, those can become nuisances. They can find waterways, they can be a hazard to boaters. Uh, five intakes and engines. That's just not something that I think is a concern um, in, in the lower Chesapeake Bay, especially not in the next 50 years, um, as we're looking at combination of climate change and trying to improve water clarity. Um, so I'd be thrilled if we saw an expansion like you described. But if the grass did start to expand, like you were talking about, uh, the natural controls are going to depth, so their the depth limit in, they can only go as deep as there's land available. Um, and so we wouldn't expect to see grasses, in, in a lot of cases, three meters would be the absolute maximum. Um, uh, the, the rays, so counters rays in particular, they can do a lot of damage to grass beds when they're foraging for um, uh, soft clams, hard clams that are in the grass bed. Uh, waterfowl um, will be feeding on them, but they can do some damage. Um, even things like blue cracks will dig um, you know, little holes and patches and stuff. There's, there's a natural uh, mosaic of, of habitat where you'll have grass kind of coming and going, even in the most healthy of places. Um, and, uh, and I wouldn't expect, you're not going to see this stuff go from shore to shore. Um, it just won't, won't go outside the shallow water. Uh, this, this is Willie, just a quick comment on that. You know, we're looking at some of our healthier beds sitting out at our research reserve site. We have major heat stress diebacks about every five years. I, I, I'm sort of concurring with Chris that I, I wouldn't bet on it uh, exploding. All right, any other questions? Well, with that, I think we'd like to uh, wrap it up. Uh, thank everybody for coming out here on a Tuesday night, um, five days before Christmas. And uh, appreciate everyone's time. And uh, thank you for this. This will be coming up at VMRC's hearing, I believe, in January. So if you want to comment further, you can go online or you can show up in January. Um, we'll be in session, so I will not be able to be there. Thank you very much, and uh, have a Merry Christmas. Thank you.